plants, animals, and all kinds of life have a chemical cycle within them. The earth also has its own chemical reactions that help sustain and replenish the nutrients needed for life to go on. From the air we breathe, the waters we drink, and the soil set foot on, all of nature has its own nutrient pathways generally known as the biogeochemical cycle. There are two commonly known types of the biogeochemical cycle, both of which involve biological and non-biological processes that drive the flow of energy throughout the ecosystem. Let us start off with the air surrounding us, the gaseous cycle. Gaseous cycles happen globally with the air life needs. Oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon dioxide. Nitrogen makes up 78% of the world's atmosphere, followed by oxygen at 21% and a bottle less than 1% for carbon dioxide. The other type of the biogeochemical cycle is the sedimentary cycle, involving the soil, rocks, and minerals. Life depends on this cycle because the minerals it needs comes from the inorganic materials this cycle processes. Salts from the soils and waters provide nourishment for life to thrive. Minerals come directly from the earth's crust through weathering when the salts enter the water cycle. Water helps the salts move through the soil to reach other bodies of water, while others return to the earth's crust by sedimentation. Sedimentation makes up the salt beds, silts, and limestones of the land. When these sediments weather, they enter the cycle once again. Nutrients are carried through the ecosystem by these biogeochemical cycles, but first, they have to enter the ecosystem somehow. Nutrients such as carbon and nitrogen are recycled by the atmosphere through the gaseous cycle, while nutrients such as calcium and phosphorus have to go through the sedimentary cycle. Before all of these nutrients enter either one of these cycles, they have to be carried by other forces of nature. Rain, snow, winds, and animals. Wetfall is named for nutrients after they have experienced precipitation. Such is called for dust particles of calcium, sea salts, and the nuclei for the formation of raindrops. Dryfall is for those nutrients that are brought into a cycle by airborne particles. Other ways where nutrients enter a cycle are brought about by water. As nutrients leave an ecosystem, they are often exported to the atmosphere. Carbon, for example, is exported to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide whenever respiration happens. Although the transport of organic matter can be a significant source of nutrient loss from an ecosystem, organic matter plays a key role in recycling nutrients because it prevents rapid losses from the system. Large quantities of nutrients are bound tightly in organic matter structure, thus, they are not readily available until released by the activities of decomposers. Nutrients, however, are torn from the ecosystem permanently by farming and logging because biomass is directly removed from the ecosystem. But they can be replaced by applying fertilizers. Otherwise, no life can thrive in such impoverished ecosystems. Ecosystems can also lose nutrients from fires as these nutrients are carried away by the atmosphere. Ashes from fires are readily available nutrients, such as phosphorus, but in order for these nutrients to return to the ecosystem, they must be recovered from the soil by plants and other microbes consequently. Otherwise, leaching and erosion will carry these nutrients away from the ecosystem. One of the biogeochemical cycles happening globally is the carbon cycle. Carbon, a basic element of all organic compounds, is involved in the fixation of energy by photosynthesis. Carbon is closely tied to energy flow and that these two are very much inseparable. Carbon comes from both living organisms and fossil deposits. It also comes as carbon dioxide from the air and water. Photosynthesis draws carbon dioxide from the air and water to store them in living components primarily the plants of the ecosystem. The plants are then eaten by herbivores and then by carnivores. Carbon then comes back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide as these consumers respire. 
the carbon in plant and animal tissues eventually goes back to the atmosphere once they die and become eaten by the respiring decomposers. However, some marine animals such as mollusks and sponges store carbon into their shells or exoskeletons as a compound called carbonate. Some carbonates dissolve back into solution and return to the carbon cycle, while others become buried indefinitely, thus leaving the carbon cycle and the ecosystem losing some nutrients, particularly carbon. Another story of the biogeochemical cycles is about the element dominating the skies. Nitrogen is an important component of amino acids, which, when chained together, builds up the proteins that make all life on Earth exist. Nitrogen in its molecular state, N2, makes up almost 80% of the world's atmosphere, though it cannot be absorbed directly by the plants. Plants generally prefer nitrogen to come in either chemical forms, ammonium or nitrate. So how does nitrogen enter the ecosystem without it being either of those forms? One way for nitrogen to become part of the ecosystem is through atmospheric deposition. Rain, fog, aerosols, and particulates can be joined by nitrogen to be readily absorbed by the plants. Another way for nitrogen to enter the ecosystem is nitrogen fixation. Fixation can come in two ways, high energy fixation and biological nitrogen fixation. Lightning, meteors, and cosmic radiation provide high amounts of energy to make nitrogen combine with oxygen or water in the atmosphere. Ammonia, nitrates, and nitric acids made from the combinations can then enter the Earth's surface through rain. Then, nitrogen is assimilated by the plants. Biological nitrogen fixation are done by cyanobacteria, free-living aerobic bacteria, and symbiotic bacteria living in mutualistic association with plants. These bacteria can speak molecular nitrogen from the atmosphere into two nitrogen atoms and combine them with hydrogen atoms to make two ammonia molecules. Decomposers are also part of the biological nitrogen fixation since they turn dead organic matter into ammonia and nitrates as well. Plants do, however, compete with aerobic bacteria for ammonia. Nitrification by bacteria produces nitrate by oxidizing ammonia. The nitrate can then either be taken up by the plants, be carried away by stream or groundwaters, or be denitrified by anaerobic bacteria. Denitrification reduces nitrate into nitrous oxide and molecular nitrogen. Thereby, nitrogen can leave the ecosystem and return to the atmosphere once again. And so, the nitrogen cycle may start anew. For a case of phosphorus, it only occurs in the atmosphere in minute amounts only. Therefore, the phosphorus cycle also follows the same way of the water or hydrological cycle from land to sea. Also, phosphorus loss from the ecosystem in this way is not recoverable. It cannot be returned via the biogeochemical cycle, which is the reason for its short supply under undisturbed natural conditions. This natural case of phosphorus scarcity in aquatic ecosystems is emphasized by the explosive growth of algae in water receiving discharges of phosphorus-rich waters. The main reservoirs of phosphorus are rocks and natural phosphate deposits and by leaching, weathering, erosion, and mining, phosphorus is released from the rocks for production of agricultural fertilizers. The major process that regulates phosphorus availability is the internal cycling of phosphorus from organic to inorganic forms. For the case of marine and freshwater ecosystems, phosphorus moves through the cycle in three forms, particulate organic phosphate, dissolved organic phosphate, and inorganic phosphate. Planktons take up quickly all forms of phosphate, which in turn are eaten by zooplankton and detritus feeding organisms. Zooplankton may excrete 
phosphorus daily. Returning it to the cycle and more than half of this excreted phosphorus is in form of inorganic phosphate. This could be taken off by the phytoplankton. The remaining phosphorus in aquatic ecosystems exists in organic compounds that may be used by bacteria which fail to regenerate much dissolved inorganic phosphate. As bacteria are consumed by microbial grazers, they excrete the phosphate they ingest. Parts of the phosphate is deposited in shallow sediments and parts in deep water. Phosphates from deep waters will be returned to the surface by upwelling. At the surface, light is readily available to dry photosynthesis. The phosphates that return to the surface are consumed by phytoplankton. Phosphorus contained in the bodies of plants and animals that sunk to the bottom is deposited in the sediments. This cascade of events results in low level of phosphorus at the surface and saturation of phosphorus at the deep waters. Much of this phosphorus will be locked up for the long periods of time in the hypolimnion and bottom sediments. Although global phosphorus cycle does not have its atmospheric component, airborne transport of phosphorus in soil dust and sea spray is of order of 1 times 10 raised to 12 grams of phosphorus annually. Rivers transport about 21 times 10 raised to 12 grams of phosphorus annually but only about 10% of this is available for net primary production. The remaining 90% is deposited in the sediments. Although phosphorus in ocean waters is low, the large volume of water globally makes it a significant amount. Atmospheric oxygen is the main source of free oxygen for life support. And there are two significant sources, breakup of water vapor driven by sunlight and photosynthesis. The first source works by dissociation of water into hydrogen and oxygen, and most of the hydrogen is, escapes to space. Hydrogen that was not able to escape would only recombine to oxygen to form water vapor again. The second source, photosynthesis, has been active only since life began on Earth. Oxygen are produced by photosynthetic autotrophs and consumed by both autotrophs and heterotrophs in the process of cellular respiration. Due to the alternating use and release of oxygen offered by cellular respiration and photosynthesis, it would seem that one will balance the other so no significant amount of oxygen would accumulate in the atmosphere. Nevertheless, Earth's history had one part wherein released oxygen exceeded the amount of it used by respiration and geological processes and part of the oxygen in the atmosphere. It's due to the imbalance of respira respiration and photosynthesis in the past. Part of the atmospheric oxygen is reduced by ultraviolet radiation to form ozone. By breaking the oxygen-oxygen bond and combination of free oxygen rapidly, it is an ambivalent atmospheric gas that shields the planet from biologically harmful UV radiation. It is positioned at the stratosphere, 10 to 40 kilometers above Earth, and when close to ground, it is a damaging pollutant that could irritate ice and respiratory systems and injuring or killing plant life. In the troposphere, ozone is born from the union of nitrogen oxides and oxygen in the presence of sunlight. Ozone is also produced and diminished at the same rate in natural conditions as the stratosphere. However, because of the presence of catalysts for diminishing ozone, reduction of stratospheric ozone is favored more. These catalysts include several human caused and some naturally derived chlorofluorocarbons nitrous oxide and chlorine monoxide.